Welcome to our inaugural Deep Dive into Design book group, done in partnership with the Stanford D School. This book group explores how the creative capacity of design has the transformative power of shaping a more beautiful, caring, and just world. We focus on visionary works that challenge us to rethink our designed environments and how we interact with them. This book group promotes a dialogue on how human creativity could come into harmony with both natural and human-made ecologies. Whether you're a design enthusiast or simply curious about design, these roundtables and informal discussions demystify design as a creative capacity that is accessible to all. Tonight, we will start off with an introductory roundtable with Carissa Carter and Scott Durley, authors of their new book, Assembling Tomorrow. Uh, Carissa and Scott, if you can wave to the audience and let them know who you are visually. Joining us for this introductory roundtable are the creative forces in the field whose design work relates to this book's inquiry. How might we reassemble tomorrow? They are Luam Malaki, an interdisciplinary artist joining us all the way from New York City. Luam, do you want to wait for the crowd so they know who you are? And Quinlan Messenger, the founder and director of Just Design, a collaborative coalition that believes that the future can be just if we just step up and design it. I am Nico Chen, the program manager here at Mechanics Institute. I'm just gonna take some time to admit um, everyone in the room so that they can actually hear what I'm saying. There we go. To our returning members at Mechanics Institute, it's welcome to see you again in our virtual space. And for those of you who are attending a Mechanics Institute event for the first time, a warm welcome to you as well. Established in 1854, Mechanics Institute is one of San Francisco's most vibrant literary and cultural uh, hubs nestled in the heart of the city of San Francisco. Housing a comprehensive general interest library, an internationally renowned chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and the esteemed cinema lit film series, um, we are just a space where people of all backgrounds can come in and find something of their liking. SF Standard calls us the coolest library in downtown San Francisco and a sanctuary for remote work. Experience the magic of Mechanics Institute firsthand by joining us for a free tour every Wednesday at noon. During today's roundtable with our esteemed guests, we invite you to also add your emerging questions into the chat box. During this time, we also ask you to put yourself on mute so that we can clearly hear our esteemed um, guests during this introductory roundtable. While I can't quite guarantee that we will be able to get to everyone's question, I will do my best to integrate the audience's inquiry at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time. Thank you once again for joining us, and let's go ahead and dive into our introductory roundtable with our guests today. So we will begin with the inquiry of this roundtable, and that question is, how might we reassemble tomorrow. How might we reassemble tomorrow? Luam, do you want to get us started with that? Um... <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Nika. Thanks for having me. Um, how might we reassemble tomorrow? Um, sorry, I, am I doing the excerpt? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yes. So um, um, we, we will begin with, um, for, for this question, each roundtable guest will begin with either an excerpt or some um, some parts of the book that they want to refer to, and then sort of answer that question after that sharing. Okay. Sorry. So um, what I really love about this book is that a lot of it is about designing for emotions, which is something that I do in my practice. But this is really like an analysis of, of how you do that and like what happens when you don't do it. Um, so I really loved the sections that were like about how there's this mentality and technology and design that you're transcending, um, you know, that, that you're transcending the limitations of a human body, for example, which like kind of goes back to Marshall McLuhan as like, you know, the wheel is an extension of the leg and therefore you've transcended what the leg can do. But actually like the constraints of nature, the constraints of human of, of human nature are also constraints that should be designed for because you can't transcend those. And so it's actually more sophisticated to think of the constraints as being something that you allow space for rather than something that you resist or ignore because if you can't change it, then why ignore it? So I found those sections to be particularly interesting because like if I could change the wording on that a little bit, I think of like I think of constraints as being something as being something that someone who is problem solving is paying attention to because the constraints are 
the sort of problem that you're trying to resolve rather than transcend. And I think there's a little bit of a lost thread on technology and problem solving, which is one of my gripes about where tech has been going recently, which is that it's sort of creating new problems without the intention of solving them. And if we're living in a time where we have a lot of problems and there's like an acknowledgement that there are crises happening. And so it worries me that some of our best minds in the country are working on like novelty production rather than like specific problems to be solved and then creating these problems by ignoring the constraints of human nature and nature itself. So all of that was super interesting to me. And I loved particularly this phrase, the circular economy of the imagination, which I found very powerful um, because the idea of waste as being something that is like psychological about, about ideas being wasted, about imagination being wasted. I mean, when you commodify people's attention spans and attention becomes commodified, what is attention but the solution to loneliness? You know, that that's what you need if you're lonely is like you're waiting for someone to give you attention. And so we're commodifying things that like we actually really need. It's like, it's, it's the pol polluting society through human minds, which is terrifying to say out loud, but that's not, that's not exactly what it is. But it's, I just think that that phrase circular economy of the imagination is really powerful in the context of this conversation about designing for emotions. Thank you so much for sharing that, Luam. I'm going to pass the mic over to Quinlan. Quinlan, how might we reassemble tomorrow? Hi, everyone. Uh, great to see some uh, familiar faces, new faces here. And uh, <clears throat> just want to thank the Mechanics Institute for uh, including Luam and myself, as well as Scott and Carissa in the inaugural uh, design book group. Um, and also, I want to thank Scott and Carissa for bringing this uh, body of writing uh, to the masses. Uh, I, I have continued to be inspired from it. Uh, and I love that the format, given that there's these imagined worlds, I can kind of open it anywhere and sort of dive in, uh, which has actually been really accessible for, for me as a reader. Um, but Nico, to your question, um, you know, I've, I, I, you know, as a designer in the sphere of equity and justice, um, I, this, this question really, you know, sort of hits home. And for me, uh, there was this one, uh, uh, quote in, in the book, our personal experiences shape how we view design. You can't separate yourself from your work and you should bring your whole self to it. Um, you know, for me, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to also put myself in the shoes of those who are not designers or see themselves as designers. I believe we are all designers, uh, whether we're designing our schedules of our day or designing how we're laying out our gardens or designing the clothes that we're going to put on our bodies or where we're, we're buying them from. Uh, but with that in mind, you know, for me, um, I, I really, whether it is a, a personal charge or a mission, or it is just the way in which I have uh, navigated my own identity as a person of many different colors. Um, you know, I really draw on the legacy of my own heritage. Um, it's an intersection and a tapestry of multiple cultures ranging from the African American experience, the Jewish experience, uh, indigenous experiences from the Yaki and Lakota tribes. Um, and for me, I really find that by sort of tapping into this, this notion of allowing ourselves and our personal experiences to sort of inform and guide uh, what we feel is important in the world uh, can really help to uh, bring a great conversation and dialogue um, to the design sphere in, in general. And I think, you know, to me, that's what I was really, in, really reading into uh, what Scott and Chris were sharing with that quote is that by all of us sort of really leaning into ourselves and drawing inspiration from that, the, the conversation becomes much more diverse and inclusive in that way. Oh, white people um, love this song. That was, uh, that's, that's my, my bit there. <clears throat> we'll move the question, how might we read, uh, how might we reassemble tomorrow to the book's authors? Uh, why don't we have Carissa answer that question? Great, thank you. And uh, it's, really an, like an honor and really fun to hear uh, your in, your what resonated with each of you, Luam and Quinlan. It's, it mm -hmm. feels like this period after we've written the book and like how it's digested in other people's brains is 
it's like almost better than the actual creation of it because you start to realize like oh this is what my book is actually about right like and it's with that time that that happened so very much appreciate both of your responses and to buoy off of them um one one area for me that that resonates a lot and shows up a lot in the work that that I do at Stanford um falls within the chapter on make believe and I like this because I'm very interested in both sensing and sense making. And there are, you know, building off of like, you always show up in your work, Quinlan, what you just said, right? Also, we all sense only this one slice, teeny tiny slice of the world. That's partly because we're human. That's partly because of um, the cultures that we're from. That's partly because of the context that we live in. That's partly because of like, there's only so many hours in a day and so many tools we know how to use, right? And so you can really, like each of us is only just experiencing and sensing just a little tiny bit of what's actually happening. So as a designer, how do you like gather and make sense of all, all these different ways of being and existing that come from not just yourself, but all these other people and the other inhabitants of this planet? I think how we are beginning and growing our ways of sensing the natural world in addition to sensing the human experience has been really top of mind for me lately. And so the, the, the tools that we share in the back half of the book, some of them are around like how to begin to make sense and like what are new ways of looking at your own world um, with fresh eyes. That that those types of things, um, I I love to 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 practice and explore a lot, and I feel like as as humans and as designers, we're only scratching the surface as to what's going to be possible in the near future, both with technology and and just by talking to more people more. Thank you for sharing that, Carissa. Um, I'll pass that question. How might we reassemble tomorrow to Scott? Thanks, Nico. And just to echo what Chris was saying, it is, you know, an amazing honor and really a treat to hear your reactions, Luam and uh, Quinlan. It's like, uh, I don't know, it's just, it's beautiful to be able to talk to people about these ideas. I feel so fortunate. Um, I have a quote from the back of the book, which is from Charles Eames, a American white mid-century designer who, um, was reflecting on his career and the opening sentence, which I'll read and then I'll kind of paraphrase the rest is the scary fact is that many of our dreams have come true. And I think that's like a really interesting, you know, it doesn't feel like dreams coming true should be scary. He then goes on to talk about, which I think is very similar to the point Luam was making, but we wanted more efficient technology and we got pesticides. You know, everybody thought they were the only person wanting the things they wanted. And we kind of overfilled and overpolluted um, Lake Michigan and the world. And he goes on to say that that doesn't mean the dreams were all wrong. It means that there was an error somewhere in the wish and we have to fix it. Um, and I think that ability to acknowledge that our dreams are incomplete, similar to what Quinlan and Chris were saying about, you know, we each have our own perspective and we can only see what we can see. And it's okay to admit that. I think there is some resistance to that, to feeling like, you know, if you're wrong, you're, you're somehow bad, you know? Um, and I, and I think they're different things and, and I'm really, kind of um, excited about the fact that our students in particular really aren't afraid to have those things be part of their design, you know, the the responsibility as well as sort of the excitement and the possibility. Thank you so much for sharing that, Scott. Um, we're going to start moving into a different question now. And I remember a phrase from the beginning of the book, and that phrase was that, um, all design starts as fiction. And it makes me think about justice as something that doesn't quite exist yet as an idealized fiction. Um, so how could design thinking be applied to spur on the creation of a just world? Or is this even the question that I should be asking? And I'm gonna hand that question first to, to Quinlan. Ooh. Uh... Nico, I love that you come with the, the, the heavy hitting questions and it's absolutely a question to be asking and glad that you've brought it into the circle here. Um, you know, I guess for me, uh, in response to that, 
Um, you know, I think justice uh, is not black and white. You know, justice in a way, I guess in some ways, it's like a song. Uh, it rises and it falls. It has movement. It changes in that way. Um, but I also, I, I think if we look at the history of design, um, there is clear indication that that design has the power to shape inequity and shape injustice. Uh, if we look, you know, domestically here in America is like an example uh, at redlining, at gerrymandering, at these uh, uh, strategies that people in a position of power have literally designed to keep other people uh, from being able to have access to either resources or their own sovereignty. Um, that somebody came up with that idea, right? And that that was an imagination that then became real and had significant impacts on people. I mean, if you look at environmental racism, I mean, uh, here in the Bay Area, uh, you know, where Mechanics Institute is, not too far south in East Palo Alto, I think there's great examples of um, some of the wounds and scars that have been left as a result of, of environmental racism. But out of that, I think are great opportunities for um, those most impacted um, to be equipped with access and to be equipped with resources to design out of those conditions. Um, and I'm a firm believer that justice and equity can be designed for. Um, and I think too, you know, as designers um, and even as just general people in the world that are sort of interacting with other conditions or contexts that somebody else has designed, um, but I think we all have a role um, and responsibility to our own biases and the impact that they may have or create or influence in the context that we're in. And that does require a lot of sort of introspection and being able to sort of pause and take a step back. But to Nico, you know, to your question about sort of this ideal of justice as a fiction, um, I, I do believe that justice has and does exist. Um, but like a participant, I guess, in any ecosystem, um, justice and equity has been challenged. It evolved, it is made, and it is remade. Um, and I really think that that's where we can take our, we can take a stance and we can take a position in terms of how we want to participate in that. Are we going to be a co-conspirator in our design? Are we going to be an advocate, an ally? you know, really sort of coming in touch with our own biases that might limit us from being able to navigate in those spaces so that we can show up um, in an authentic way. Um, but, you know, again, I think that this book, um, you know, that Scott and Carissa have, have uh, gifted us with is it's a beautiful example of how we can all imagine these different worlds and, and, and different futures um, that we can, we can all be a part of and, and take a part in. I love what you said, Quinlan, and um, perhaps Scott or, or Carissa, maybe you want you might want to step in at this point to maybe share maybe some of the schemas that the book shares that might help someone who might be confused of how do we realize justice in a in a way that you know like like could, could bring in more co-conspirators. Happy to take a crack first, Scott, and then you could hear your take on it too. Um, I think one one um, I, I really resonate uh, with what you're saying, Quinlan, about you know in the same way that you know design begins as fiction and everything needs to be imagined before it's created. It's absolutely the same with justice and injustice, which is the is the world that we're living in now. And the systems of oppression, all the experiences, the products that perpetuate that have all been design decisions. Some of them highly intentional, others byproducts and, you know, and, you know, negative consequences down the road. And so I, I want to then like think about um, whether or not you consider yourself a designer. You do design things within your everyday life. One thing that we do in our work as designers and that we talk about a lot with others that are just learning or starting out is that think about when everything goes right with what I'm doing, like what's what what could still go wrong? Like what what are the downstream effects of my work that could come to pass that are unintended consequences? And so 
Um, one, one, one tool for that is to ask yourself, like, well, it's it, it like if you think about uh, we call it or we call it a, our, our colleague Lisa K. Solomon calls it a futures wheel. So if I the simple way to think about this is if I say, OK, I, I, I would like to build, you know, um, a new a new vessel for drinking, uh, you know, and this this doesn't feel like a design justice decision right now. If I'm going to create a new vessel for drinking. Well, um, if this if this really takes off and it's really successful, um, who's who's that going to affect and why? Maybe my new vessel for drinking is like really easy to hold uh, with one hand um, and also like drive at the same time. Okay, well, you know, like that's going to have effects on people that um, have to commute and eat at the same time. Um, maybe that is a decision that like makes me think about people that don't have the use, the like the ability to use their arms in some way. Um, you know, whether or not this is like a good idea to create this, this concept, like I could think of, well, what materials is this going to be made of? Like, if it takes a while for them to get to me, what's the effects on the on the distribution pipeline? Like, if you have to expand on your what you're creating, um, in a way that you're thinking of all the different layers of design that affects it and what effects it may then perpetually have. And then ask yourself, like, who is that marginalized? marginalizing somebody on the way? If so, how? Um, and what can I do now to mitigate that happening, but then also know that like, I'm going to be paying attention to make sure that that doesn't happen throughout, that I'm going to like volunteer to be a shepherd of that work um, as I bring it forward. Yeah, and I, I can add on just a little bit. I think that was incredibly well articulated. I think as these second order effects happening start happening, like Chris is talking about, like as an example, we have these tools now, say generative AI that can like, or, or even the mobile phone where it's like, you've got so much power in your pocket to do so many things that sort of new inequities get birthed. It's sort of this mistakes in the dream thing. And I think one that's going to be really important to look at is time. Who has time to do things? And do we have time divides in society? And mental bandwidth, I think, is another one sort of cognitive load. And how do we mitigate those things? Because hopefully we'll get to the point where actually it's easier and easier to create things. I think you've seen that happen over time. Um, so who has the time to be creating? Who has the time to think about new thoughts? And it gets back to the imagination and that circular economy. Thank you so much for those wonderful insights. I'm going to move on to the next question. This book discusses the interconnectedness of people, technology, and the natural world. How do we begin to integrate this trifecta of our own into our own design work? And how might we actually heal the relationships between human beings, our technological innovations, and mother nature? And I'm gonna hand that question to Luan. Um, well, this book brilliantly connects those three things in ways that I think are unexpected. Like there are obvious connections between those three things, but I think what we have to do to move forward is to think more deeply about the overarching structure of how those things relate to each other and new avenues to explore in how those things could re relate to each other better or more effectively. Or um, yeah, like for example, in my work, those three things relate to each other in a lot of different ways. Uh, so, you know, like I'm a materials researcher and I've been doing that for a very long time in addition to my own studio practice as an artist and a designer. And um, one thing that I've noticed is that people don't notice architecture. <laughs> You know, like a thousand decisions are made for every single building. And some of them are so minute that like even a trained eye wouldn't even notice all of these decisions. And it's like thousands of decisions compounded into one space. And when people move through that space, they're sort of left with a feeling. They're not really left with the details. And so all of those decisions amount to the feeling, but like, what about all those details? So. I do um, weaving as one side of my practice where I use materials from the built environment to create sort of tapestries or sculptures out of um, industrial materials. 
And my thesis with that work is that actually people do notice the materials of the built environment. They notice the properties of the types of materials. They notice things that they don't necessarily bring to cognition or bring to the forefront of their minds. They're not necessarily thinking about it while they're occupying space, but somewhere it lives in the mind because our brain is really designed for metaphor. It's designed to say this thing is like that thing. That thing was scary, so you should run from that thing too. So our brains are always processing visual information, the information of our world, because that's what you need to do to be safe is have these metaphoric relations between things. So I did a residency at the Museum of Arts and Design um, a while ago in 2017, where I set up these um, psychological experiments where I took little pieces of different materials and I asked people, if you could tell me a story using these materials as inspiration, what would your story be about? So people look at this box of random stuff <laughs> and there's no actual narrative content to derive a story from. And yet most people told me a story that was deeply personal about their own life that had to do with exactly the theme that I was trying to address. And then I did the reverse where I said, here's a concept. What is a person with no moral integrity made of? Name, name some materials that that person is made of, you know? And so these people are from all walks of life, all ages, all different countries. They're just like mostly tourists <laughs> visiting New York and going to a museum. And uh, eventually the list stopped and it didn't take that long because people had these properties of materials in mind. They said oh, something in between a solid and liquid, something that oozes, something black and sticky, something, you know, and these were all materials from the built environment, more or less, or commodities that they'd experienced. So I think we have all of these subconscious relationships with our built environment, with technology. And some of those things really need to be exploited because I think as we start to dig into like how we think about, you know, nature, technology, whatever the built environment, we can start to think about like the structure of how we think and then design for the structure of how we think. So the other side of my practice is furniture and my furniture is specifically designed to mitigate the uh, pervasiveness of the digital technology, the digital lives that we're living in. Because if we're only optimizing the tools for our digital life, then what happens to our physical life? What happens to our senses? Are, are our senses going to be dulled? Are we gonna stop knowing how to like converse with each other? Is, all, is like all of human evolution and all the things that we our brains have been designed for suddenly going to start malfunctioning the way that like, if you try to like use your microwave to call on a phone, like it's not gonna work. <laughs> and we're kind of doing that with our brains. Like they weren't really designed to be like solo, like communicating through language because most of our communication structure is through the senses. It's things that we don't even understand. It's things that we haven't even fully like gotten into. I mean, most of like behave, the relationship between behavior and distance is really something that happened in the sixties. So anyway, I could talk forever, but basically like my furniture is about bringing an awareness back to uh, the body and the relationship between our relationship between our physical world and mitigating our relationship to our digital world through that. Um, and then I do, I have another side of my work, which is really about thinking about um, the physical built environment and human health and, um, and, and um, yeah, the built environment, nature and human health. So those were the moments in the book that I really was just like reveling in because <laughs> there were so many moments that were super interesting in that way. Like there was that one image in the beginning of the book, I'm sorry, I don't have the page number, but um, where it was like the Colorado River, the Colorado River emerged and the, the Grand Canyon emerged from like a series of reactions. The internet is based on a chain of emotional reactions. So like that's kind of the structure, the overarching structure of how things work. It's like, it's just things reacting to each other. And I think that kind of like broad analysis is really gonna help us define like how we move forward and how we think about design as having a, a reaction and a counter reaction. We have a digital life, what about our sensory life? Let's think about that. And just approaching things from all different sides. Thank you so much for sharing that, Luam. Uh, Scott, would you like to respond to something that Luam has said? Sure. Just just to add to it, um, I love that you're making these connections between sort of built things and emotional things. You know, the idea of like buildings and health, and like there there is a, a lot of research going on right now about how you know airflow can help with health, which is an obvious one since the pandemic. 
Um, there's some research about people like being able to see trees and recovery times if you can see a tree or if you can't see a tree. And I think like these linkages are the things that, you know, some people have paid attention to, but a lot of times we're not because we're we're so over focused on certain aspects of what we design. Uh, usually it's cost, frankly. Um, and so when you're just focused on that, you miss these other things that have these chain reactions. So I'm just, I, I really can't, can't agree more. I think that's what I mean to say. I quite agree with, with that. And I love this idea of these metaphorical connections that you can draw. I want to segue into um, Dave's question that he added into our chat box. He asked, Given the focus of reassembling tomorrow, how does this book address the unintended consequences as we in design, even as even if we're as thoughtful as possible, even if we think about all of these interconnections? Maybe uh, Carissa, do you want to get us started with that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, so like what the 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 big premise of the book. Um, if you're not if you're not familiar with it, is that we are living in a runaway design moment. And what we mean by that is that, you know, just like um, Luam was talking about and Scott added to, nature is on the on the fritz with how humans have impacted it um, of how climate is changing. Our technologies are, accelerating like what they can do is accelerating really rapidly and in ways that are um, quite invisible to the naked eye and this is really um, having an effect on us as humans and so the relationship between humans and the natural world how we're affecting it how we are affecting tech and tech is affecting us and how technology is affecting the the, the natural world this like this love triangle, Scott and I were always calling it a love triangle in our in our work leading up to writing the book. It's really collapsing, right? All those relationships are collapsing upon themselves in making this moment um, that we exist in feel quite fraught. And how do you make your way through that um, in a way that feels like you as an individual have a lot of agency? And in the in the reality is like, yeah, everything we do is going to have unintended consequences. However, by like really the, like taking some some ways of looking at our current work in new ways so that we can see the unseen. And there's many tactics in the book that allow you to see the unseen. The entire back half of the book are um, we call them actionables and they're um, different ways to um, give yourself a new look at 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 what might be happening right now in your life, in your work, um, with what technologies are coming out into the world. Um, they're full of a bunch of different techniques that will help you see the unseen and notice what's happening so that those unintended consequences, they're not gonna ever go away entirely. I, that's just the, the nature of our work, but we can all get better at, at spotting them from the get-go and and taking responsibility to shepherd what we put into the world um, it w forward with time. Some of those have to do with noticing being awkward situations, um, changing the way that you work and like where you get inspiration from, um, disorientation. So ways to you know get lost in in challenge the assumptions you have in your own context, and then also to we call it. Um, not aiming for imperfection, aim for it, or not aiming for perfection, aim for imperfection. So um, really that this comes up, brings up the humility that Scott was talking about in the beginning is like, you know, we all want our work to, you know, be amazing and helpful and solve everything. But if we can start being honest that like, that's not always going to happen and things will always affect things in unintended ways. Um, then we're gonna, then we're all gonna be the better for it, and bring that, bring more of that humility into um, the launch of. Honestly, a lot of the technological world is full of hubris and full of hope and promise, and like what Luam, you were saying in the beginning that people like are in love with the fact that they can tinker with this little thing and make this thing happen in an algorithm out there in the world, right? Like, but not thinking if that's the right problem that we should be working on. So. 
um that's how we break it up within the book itself dave i hope that um helps you give you some overall context as to as to how we address it within uh carissa could i piggyback on on what you had shared um yes please as you're hearing it uh, it's a great question dave um and you know something that keeps coming to mind for me is um you know i think a lot of times in design we kind of we, we, we do our best as designers, but I think at large, uh, the blinders come on sometimes and it's like, oh, this is the problem we're solving, but we're not thinking about that problem in a broader ecosystem. And that's something that, you know, in the work that we do at Just is really integral to our approach. And, and we have actually learned from others that if, if we're designing for something being considerate of the fact that that is existing within a broader ecosystem to Carissa's point earlier about like, you know, what if we're designing something that you hold while you're driving like a vessel, um, you know, the generative inquiry around that is quite right, right? It's like, well, okay, first of all, what's it made out of? Okay, it's made out of aluminum. Where's the aluminum coming from? What mine is that? Who's mining it? Why are they mining it? How are they getting compensated? Like th that's just one question based off of how it's made. And there's so many out there. Um, so I think being considerate of, of almost mapping the ecosystem of a design challenge or problem can help us start to see areas where unintended consequences might go, um, but also maybe acknowledge, you know, blind spots that you as a designer or a design team might have. Um, so Dave, in tandem with some of what Carissa outlined, I thought that might be something uh, as sort of a design practice or methodology uh, to, to also keep in mind. <clears throat> yep, sorry, I just want to add to, um, this has sort of been said, but I just want to say it again, is that I think interdisciplinary approaches to a problem are really crucial in finding out what the unintended consequences are, because when people come together with different perspectives, different expertise, they'll see it through their lens. And it's okay to see through your lens if you have other lenses that are looking too, and then you can see how those lenses overlap. Um, I also think like this isn't explicitly said, but I think it's implicitly in the text <laughs> um, of the book. But I think like what we should consider is like looking at established conventions as if they're rough drafts and really thinking like, where's where could this go next? Like, And it's really easy for things to become conventional or established in technology, especially because things change so fast. You know, TikTok just came like last year or whatever, and it's already like, <laughs> it's already like a giant. So I think it's, it's good to think in terms of like that. So like with me, like I look at a chair and I think, wow, there are a lot of unintended consequences of a chair. Like it, for one thing, I can only face in one direction, but what if someone's over there? Like, why is it fixed if everything else in the room is moving? What's our relationship to it if it's static and we're not? So how do I change that? How do I make a static thing more dynamic? How do I make it so that, you know, and it's a chair, it's been around for thousands of years, but like, why aren't we thinking more about what it could be? And I think that's where, I think that curiosity needs to be there, not just in design and technology, but throughout like lots of different disciplines and just sort of thinking about new approaches to how we live and thinking about our context in relation to an established convention. I'm gonna um, transition us into our last question. Um, this kind of emerges from the book. We um, as designers are always hoping to design for innovation and the wow. However, I think one great thing that is a paradigm shift in the book is to really shift into the idea of designers as healers. The call to action at the very end is the design for healing. So my question for all of you is, in what ways do you hope to heal the world we live in through design? And I'm gonna start with Scott this time around. Yeah, in the, um, I mean, I think there's so many ways. <laughs> I have to say personally, the big way for me right now is like, I feel like we're very divided and it feels like we're divided on solutions and not needs, meaning like, I feel like we're all suffering next to each other and not realizing how we're all kind of experiencing similar things in different ways at different extremes, not always in the same way, not always in the same intensity. Um, and I would hope that we can get to some place where we can all recognize each other's um I don't know, deep 
deep human needs uh, that we're all experiencing together and find a way to bridge the differences. I would say that's the, that's the big one for me, but also in the book, there's just a lot of great work going on in healing around architecture. And a lot of that has to do with the how, not necessarily just the what. So the way that people create the designs and how that brings a community together or the way that they put together a material um, in such a way that everything is sourced in a, in a way that's helpful to the people who are having to mine it um, or the way that people use um, monuments as a way to heal past uh, mistakes. And I just think there's a lot of great work. One thing is to just say, like, we're not, we're just pointing at this, you know, there are tons of people, people on this call who are, who are doing this work. Um, and I think there is just a mental shift from sort of having to have a breakthrough to having something that brings things together. Thank you, Scott. And would you like to pass that question over to one of our roundtable guests? Sure, I'll pass over to Quinlan. Thanks, Scott. Um, Nico, I might need to try to poach you from Mechanics Institute and employ you at Just because your questions are awesome. Um, or maybe you can work on the side. Anyhow, uh, I think, uh, first, great question. So, you know, in thinking about ways we can heal the world through design, um, you know, for me, I really believe that there's power in reconnecting to our shared origin, our, our shared origin being our shared mother, Mother Earth, and, and like deeply considering Mother Earth as a stakeholder in everything we design and do, not just design, but like the actions of doing that design as well. Um, and I think in doing so, it, it's really the design world having more people and leaders and emerging leaders who really see themselves as stewards for blank. I don't know what that blank is, but like really owning that role of stewardship, like being in relationship with something, having a sense of care and consideration for something that's outside of yourself. And I think in doing so, we can really shift the perspective of, of, of sort of seeing ourselves as being a apart from nature like we're not a part of it but like seeing ourselves and knowing that we are a part of nature right like even in architecture it's like this indoor outdoor experience we're going to invite nature in nature's already inside the building with where it was built where it came from the, the fact that you are there experiencing it as a child of mother earth so i think this like this shifting this perspective and, and really seeing ourselves as stewards and, and knowing that we are already a part of nature can really help. I, I, it might feel like sort of foreboding and like intimidating, but also I think that there can be a great sense of empowerment from knowing that we do have uh, a stake in this and that we can uh, help serve, um, you know, towards the well-being of our, our, our shared mother. So for me, that's, that's where my mind goes to with that question. Uh, can I, do I get to pass, Nico? Yes, you sure do. <laughs> cool. uh, let's uh, pass it to Luam. Well, thank you both for those responses. Wow. Um, Scott saying that we're suffering next to each other, but not together, that really speaks to me because my work is really about empathy and my concerns about America are very much rooted in empathy and a lack of empathy. And like, it seems like, Empathy seems to be decreasing as our technology becomes more a bigger part of our lives. Um, you know, so it just feels like we really, really need to like mitigate this and like be on the other side and think, okay, well, how do we balance things out? So for me, the healing has to come from empathy. And so I, I'm trying to find ways that objects can sort of facilitate that or at least inspire some kind of connection between people even if you're by yourself and you look at something and it sparks an emotional reaction for you by yourself and you think oh someone made this so that I would feel this way then that even by itself is an emotional and an empathetic connection um so for me it's like how do we make tools for empathy which we've never I feel like is not something that that people consciously do in terms of design <laughs> um and so how do we make that more conscious how do we make that a bigger part of what design is for and doing it not not at one particular stage but really like in the experience of doing it in the experience of viewing it in the experience of of the thing um 
so yeah, that's my that's my big concern. I'll pass it to Carissa. Thank you. Um, I I'm I'm right there with with you, Quinlan, on Mother Earth as a stakeholder in all that we do. And for me, so I'll say I'm I'm reading this other book right now. It's called The Light Eaters by Zoe Schlanger, and it is all about this hidden world of plants intelligence. And it is one of those books, you know, there's always those books that like you read really slowly because, oh my God, like every single page is this realization. Like, I just want to call out to everybody here that like plants have way, like literal ways of hearing the, the cavitation, the popping of bubbles in their stems. They, there is, they, they communicate with insects and like pull them there to be like, like, you know, pollinate and to do pest control. Like they're like, it is just absolutely fascinating. At, like what goes on in the, not mind like we have it, but in the way that a, that a, that the, that a plant is built. And, and I think we, you know, the science is, is only coming together on this. And it's to me, another example of like, we as humans, like don't sense in that way. Right. We don't, we don't see in the ultraviolet. We don't, um, you know, as, as in our in our book, we talk about the, the concept of the umwelt, which is how uh, animals all sense differently. Um, you know, the butterflies taste with their feet, right? So like it, as humans, again, like we only sense in this one way. And the more in tune we can be with how the rest of the species beyond the human one, like how do we have that empathy for for the for the other inhabitants of this planet feels really really important for me. I I um I one of my favorite quotes in the book is is the opening quote in the introduction, um, which is that it may be that what we have is a world not on the verge of flying apart, but an uncreated one, still in shapeless fragments, waiting to be put together properly, and that's by this woman Catherine Ann Porter. The future is now. Um, she wrote that in 1950, which is like the height of of um, nuclear weapons, right? And like that's what she's writing that in reaction to. It's this profound optimism at a time when things feel quite fraught. And I feel that way about this moment too. I am very optimistic that if we start tuning ourselves in to the planet in new ways, in particular, to each other in new ways, like, there is a lot of hope and promise, and I'm very optimistic for what we can build together. And and my hope is that we all we all take a, a crack at that and and work together towards towards making that future we do want to exist in. I really appreciate all the beautiful voices that have congregated here today. Today, I do want to honor that we do need to move into our informal discussion. But before I do that, is if you haven't picked up your book of uh, book. Assembling tomorrow. It is a gorgeous, gorgeous. Um, it's it's a it's a tome, but not too not too big. It's about an eight hour read to really dive into these ideas. 